In this week's episode, I'm joined by Kelly Ann Wingett, CEO and founder of Alternative Wealth Partners. This week, our conversation is about accountability at Microsoft, caregiver benefits at AT AT&T, expanded college access, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Okay, Kelly, let's get started. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Would you mind introducing yourself to everyone? Sure. So I am the founder of Alternative Wealth Partners. It's a private equity company based in Dallas, Texas, and we invest in everything from oil and gas to fintech. And I came from family office and uh, the institutional world and saw a huge gap between the people that were managing the money and the people that were giving them that money and uh, their interests not aligned. So I created my own firm and created that opportunity for investors. I love that. That's really amazing. So, you know, you're the first person who has been a guest on the show who's not sort of a DEI consultant or kind of on the inside at a company. And you're the first person that's been kind of in this alternative wealth or financial planning investment kind of role. So will you tell us a little bit about the connection you see between what you do and diversity, equity, and inclusion? I think that by being diverse in a not so diverse industry like financial services is, you know, one step forward in the right direction. And I think that that all kind of boils down to representation. And yeah. I think that the, the professionals in the DEI space are focused on is creating that representation from large to small organizations. And, you know, the, my contribution to that is just being that representation in a private space the people that are managing money is specifically how we manage money doesn't look like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm not even that different from them, right? I'm just a gay and woman version of the male white version that does mostly private equity. Yeah. But a lot of your work is around empowering other women, right? Will you tell folks a little bit about your book, pitch the bitch, grab your financial future by the bags. Yes. So um, when people hear this title, they're a little confused. But if you think about it, there was a movie in 2000 called The Boiler Room. And um, in one of the scenes, the old brokers like training the new broker. And it's the rule number one is that you don't pitch the bitch. If you get a woman on the phone, you just hang up because it's wasted your time. Mm. They'll call you if the stock's up, they'll call you if the stock's down. And that's just the rule, right? And so this was in a movie and we were like, ha ha ha. But the reality is, is that these are like being said in training rooms. And I heard it like in real life very early in my career and then in different ways throughout my career. And it was always, you know, they had a a black sounding name. It's a woman's name. They're foreign. Like these types of languages were being used. And so they just weren't talked to about investment opportunities at all, despite the fact that they, did earn the income enough to qualify or they had the net worth to qualify for these types of investing because it is risky. But to assume that only 65-year-old white men can take on the risk of private investing is ridiculous. And so in my own career later on, found more confidence in talking to both people at the table about the opportunities and then going it off on my own, pretty much exclusively only speaking to both parties if they are going to be making an investment decision. And that was kind of the biggest thing. It was like women just aren't hearing it enough. And in the back of their head, they just have this like kind of ticking of you can't do it or you don't know what you're talking about or let somebody else make that decision for you. The book really helps you identify the language that is discouraging you and then like how to move beyond that and make decisions for yourself. Money should not be scary. 
and it yeah a different lens. Yeah, I completely agree. Wow, that's really interesting. I I haven't read the book yet. I I said that I will, and I promise that I will. But it sounds really great because I think that you're right. I mean, we have been sort of trained psychologically trained by the patriarchy, right? For how many centuries, essentially, to be disempowered in this way. And it's perpetuated by people in the industry to this day, as you said. So that's really, that's a, that's a really great approach. And I love that that's sort of one of your angles. Yeah. It's not just exclusively for women. It's, mm -hmm. it's really for anyone who knows what it's like to be talked to in a condescending tone about money. <laughs> if you've been spoken to that way, this book is for you. <laughs> Good line. All right. Well, in this week's five things I wrote about, or last week's five things, I wrote about how some prestigious MBA programs had achieved gender parity. And one of the readers of five things wrote back and said, Having 50% women and 50% men means non-binary and other gender diverse people are excluded because we don't fit into these options. It's important to acknowledge that we need to change how we measure gender ratios. And there's lots of fresh data about how important it is to have diversity in leadership. Um, we, I shared a few stats from Salesforce and Baker McKenzie or what their goals are in terms of including non-binary folks in representation goals. So it's so important to have that sort of gender diversity perspective as you are setting diversity goals and targets, which you should still do. So I'm going to paste some, uh, some of the new data from BlackRock in the chat as well and in the show notes. But, you know, as you're considering how to invest, where to invest, how to advise your clients, Kellyanne, can you talk a little bit about the importance of diversity? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different sides to this. Do you have diversity in your portfolio companies? Do you have diversity in your limited partners, which are your investors? And do you have uh, diversity in your management, right, and advisory teams? And that's just because there's things that, like, there's opportunities that I'll get presented that I from my own personal experience will not be able to relate to. I can understand it from like a high level, but like uh, for example, one of our portfolio companies is a company called Dapper Boy, which is a gender inclusive mm. company. I'm sure, you know, lots of people in our, in this audience are probably aware of them, but they, they went on shark tank and the feedback from shark tank, which if you've never seen the show, all of the sharks are over the age of 50, mostly male. And there's a black guy, right? So none of them are queer, none of them are young, um, and they and they will wear, you know, their only their sports memorabilia or their suits, right? So right. the feedback from Damien, right, is he he's the founder of FUBU, told the gender neutral clothing company that they were too niche. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and, if you look at the data, I don't remember the exact the exact numbers, but there's a majority of millennial Gen Z population that identifies as non-conforming in one way, right? Mm -hmm. and, or an androgynous style, which is essentially what Dapper Boy is. And that's 50, almost 50% of the voting population is that. So adults that are that age are probably going to buy a gender neutral clothing or be represented by like, I'm wearing a Dapper Boy t-shirt. It is literally just a t-shirt. Okay. I don't know how that is too niche. Um, right. And so that's kind of the thing is that if there was somebody on that committee, right. The shark tank that was younger even um, or queer would have a better understanding of how that investment opportunity could play out. And that's the biggest issue, especially in my space, is that the people that are managing hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, there might be 10% of us that are diverse compared yeah. to the rest of it that are making these investment decisions. So the solutions that are getting funded aren't to the masses, right? Being told that you like a, a company that has a menopause solution, right? <laughs> being told like, well, I don't really understand how this is going to, you know, affect a lot of people. Like it seems very niche <laughs> for 51% of the population that might experience menopause. Right. And it's because it's an all male committee. Um, right. What we're trying to change. 
Yeah, I love that. I love because it's all it all feeds into each other, right? And so it, we just have to have that kind of that broader perspective and of course that broader perspective comes from diversity. So, yes, those uh those sharks are missing out and I'm <laughs> sure that you are reaping the rewards. <laughs> Okay, so let's move into this week's good vibes. Uh, speaking of benefits, the first story this week comes from AT&T, which is offering a standout benefit among U.S. companies, 15 days of paid caregiver leave for management employees. So not just everyone, management employees. And this initiative is about acknowledging the sandwich generation caught between caring for children and aging parents. 15% of management staff are already using it, uh, averaging 4.1 days a year. I think this is really important, Kellyanne. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that they're focusing on management maybe first, I hope. <laughs> hopefully. Um, but also this is a really good incentive because I think that there are people that like get lost in the management track uh, because of these things, but that might be a motivator you know, for people to get pushed into management of that they have the additional support of being loyal to the company, right? And yeah. grow their skill set to achieve a management position in order to have that kind of additional benefit. Yeah, I, I, I think that, yes, it becomes an incentive, right? Absolutely. I think that that's another really smart way of thinking about it. It certainly creates a win-win. It creates potentially more motivated employees, potentially employees who are performing better because they have more balance, and of course, that is reducing turnover. So it's kind of a long term investment. And we hope all of these things are true <laughs> in, in meaningful ways. But I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, like data doesn't get really super hyper specific yet. Um, and so, you know, the reality is, is that women f go into and fall out of management much more quickly than their male counterparts. And so I think that that will keep more women in management and hopefully on track to executive roles. Yes. And that's where that pipeline gap is. And it's a, it's across any industry in that space. It's really bad in financial services. Yeah. I, I think that's a really great point because there is that sort of the glass cliff um, that a lot of women face especially when they do have those tough decisions to make if they're primary caregivers. It is getting better with hybrid working though. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it is. All right. The second story this week comes from Microsoft, which really is a, a great leader. I, I love talking about Microsoft because they do a lot of progressive things. One of the things they're doing now is that all employees are required to set a diversity related development goal in annual performance reviews. One of the results is a 270% uptick in voluntary DEI learning. So every single employee has a stake in this and they get to customize it to their own professional development, which I think is extra special. That is amazing. Cause I think it was, I think that making people think about it really helps. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you you kind of do things subconsciously, especially people that are aware, right, of diversity. But for those that in in the South, we deal with this, but where it's like, well, I just don't see color, right? It's right. Like, well, how can we actively do that? You know, like what is what does that mean to you, and how can you put some action items behind that? Um, I think it's helpful, and I think that people are more open to it than they think. Um, the pushback specifically here in Texas is interesting, but there's still work being done. Yeah. And I think it's really important to bring everyone into the diversity conversation because I think a lot of folks don't see themselves as diverse, but we're looking at diversity from a really broad perspective. So that can include everything from socioeconomic experience and uh, body size and mental health, like so many different components. And if Microsoft is allowing folks to tailor their goals related to their own identities and also their professional goals. I think it really is a great win-win. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a cool initiative. Yeah. Third story this week comes from Walmart, which is dimming the lights, turning off music and putting a static image on its TVs every morning between 8 and 10 a.m. to offer a sensory friendly shopping experience. It just started and it was based on a very successful pilot program. Great for folks with neurodiversity, 
But also I think it means that these folks could be spending more money at Walmart because they are less overwhelmed by the experience of shopping there. It's amazing that that's all that needed to do that. <laughs> I feel like Walmart is one of the most overwhelming places on the planet. Exactly. Um, so interesting that just turning the music off and TVs helped with that because I think the rest of the store is really overwhelming too. Yeah. And dimming the lights. And I, I, they, they particularly chose this during normally quieter hours at store locations anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's pretty simple, right? It's something that any business with a brick and mortar location, I think can consider. It's just kind of like, all right, some of these things that we talk about here on five things are not rocket science. They're, they're little adjustments that can be made. Yes, exactly. And um, I, again, it just is how good is the data and how accessible is that data? Like how are small businesses going to learn from this as well? Exactly. The fourth story is about the Common App, which is a college application app, and it now offers direct admissions to 70 member colleges. So this means that folks who fill out the Common App, even without actually finishing it, will have guaranteed admission to 70 colleges, including some pretty big name ones. I think Hampshire College in Massachusetts is in there. But this came from a pilot program as well where 33,000 students were offered admission at 14 participating institutions, 800 students accepted, and a lot of them were BIPOC. And so really this is about leveling the playing field. It's a creative solution to the rollback of affirmative action. And the more we can do to increase access and opportunity for underrepresented folks at colleges, I think is incredible. That's an interesting thing because it still doesn't make college obtainable affordable no it doesn't <laughs> um, um there's uh it's nice that they can get in but like then what obviously you said yep. that 3000 people applied but 800 accepted admission right so mm -hmm. how many of those 800 people went and for how long you know and um but it it is a step in the right direction the other part of this is how accessible is the application process are they able to do this at school are the school counselors like providing this service? Mm -hmm. or are they going to have to try to find internet access to do the applications? All of these are very wise questions. <laughs> these are things you have to think about. Like me as right. an investment manager, it's like, how realistic is this? And I'm not, so, that's, I guess the biggest difference is when I was working in family office and institutional, those questions weren't being asked. They're like, just write the check. And it's like, well, you sometimes you can't just write the check. Sometimes you actually have to like do some groundwork and write the check. Yeah. Well, I, a lot of the stories here on Five Things are celebrating incremental progress, right? Certainly the uh, unaffordability of college is a massive problem. Um, so, yeah. So there's there's a lot to do to really increase equity, but this sort of at least expands the playing field a little bit to make it uh, the, the application process yes. a little bit less intimidating. I think, I think a lot of folks don't feel like they even could get in, yeah. right. They don't, they don't, they have imposter syndrome. And so they're afraid of even, or, or they have unsupportive guidance counselors who tell them, Hey, you're not going to get into any college. Like Pete, they do this. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's like chipping away at some of that. So we'll take the little wins too. We'll take the little wins. All right. The fifth story this week is from the New York City Marathon, which was last weekend, and it's or two weekends ago. It stepped it up for running parents by offering lactation stations, a service that allowed runners to transport personal nursing pumps from the start area on Staten Island to the finish area inside Central Park. Um, inside the lactation tents, runners had access to private spaces and hand pumps. I mean, this is a pretty big deal for the one in five runners who are parents. Yes. When I was reading this story, I was like, this is unbelievable. And one of the things that we hear a lot, like in the investment space is that like women are perceived as an, an added risk mm. um, to an investment, you know, because they start families and like are emotional or something, you know, whatever their perceived risk of women is. And I'm like, women are literally running marathons, <laughs> pumping on the side of the road. <laughs> 
while you're like worried about putting band-aids on your neck, <laughs> like these these women are doing incredible things. And um that, I mean that's what I took from the stories, but I it's glad that they're like providing that support for women. But women are doing it anyways. <laughs> hmm I know. I know. And 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 other parents, right? I think it's it's really important to realize to especially women and non-binary folks who have this sort of extra layer of um, lack of support, but it's just, we are resilient, aren't we? We are tough. Yes. In many we have, ways. We have to be. All right. Well, Kellyanne, it's been really fun having you on the show this week. Thank How you. can folks keep in touch with you? If you're interested on the investment side, you can visit alternativewealthpartners.com. If you're invested in all the things that I'm doing in the DEI space or my book, it's kellyannewinget.com. And I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you want to give me a follow there, message me or reach out. I'm always available. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kellyanne. And uh, folks, this week's call to action was about Diwali, which was yesterday. It's the Indian uh, New Year, the Festival of Lights. You can learn about Diwali and how to acknowledge it and recognize it with a LinkedIn post, which I'm going to put in the comments. And it's also going to be in the show notes, courtesy of our friends at Seva Global. Thank you so much, Kellyanne. I hope you have a great week. And folks, if you don't already get the Five Things newsletter, you can subscribe at fivethingsdei.com. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you for listening to Five Things in 15 Minutes. I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI. DEI.